Are you guys fucking ready for this? This is from Lorekeeper. Now remember, Steve Denuser also did a, a an interview with a French site, which we covered on, on Thursday, I believe, on Twitch. But uh, this one will not have the oh my gods in, I fucking promise. Uh, there's not gonna be any oh my gods, I've muted notifications. But I will be thanking all of you afterwards and answering all of your questions. So if you have burning questions, Super Chat is the best way to ensure that I answer that. Anyways. Let's go. The release date for World of Warcraft Shadowlands expansion is only a month away, and we as the Lorekeeper team recently published our latest deep dive article in Turkish which covered the Zone of Maldraxxus. In preparation for that article, we had the opportunity to participate in an interview with lead narrative designer Steve Denuser. So, um, let's get into general questions here. Not going to read all of that upper stuff there. What happens when you die? in the Shadowlands. We literally just did a video on that, so let's go. The answer to that depends a little bit on what your nature is as a being. As we've seen before in Legion expansion, where if demons came to Azeroth and died on Azeroth, they would go back to the Twisting Nether, because that is the realm they are from. That same kind of rule applies to beings that are of death magic. If a Kyrian, for example, was on Azeroth and was killed, their essence would go back to the Shadowlands and be reformed there. Mortal souls are different Mortal souls begin in the mortal plane, Azeroth, other worlds, etc. And when they die, that soul with all its anima, um, anima that it's built up in life, so this is effectively the proof that we've all been discussing, like the theory that we've all been discussing up until now, where anima builds up over the course of your life, depending on, on your actions, depending on your power level. So this is basically confirming that, that part of our theory crosses over into the Shadowlands. And in the Shadowlands, that threat to your existence is real. If everything goes the way it's supposed to go, you should be able to exist for eternity. Either enjoy or endure whatever afterlife you are a part of. But if something happens to your soul there, if something destroys it, that soul is gone. There is no afterlife beyond Shadowlands. That's why stakes are real in these battles, in these conflicts. The threat the Jailer poses to the Shadowlands and the other realms beyond, it is very real and it has high stakes. Now, remember I did the video on this where I explained this, right? Souls that die in the Shadowlands effectively, and Steve Denuser is, uh, I think he said it in the French interview, um, he touched on this as well. That soul with all of its anima now simply become part of the natural existence of the Shadowlands. So the anima is not necessarily completely lost, but the anima can no longer be harvested and it will no longer build up and replenish itself over time, right? So that anima has now become a finite resource rather than an infinite resource of power. All right, so what happens? What happens to the soul in the Shadowlands if someone is raised from the dead? Now, Undeath is a force that has definitely touched Azeroth throughout history. Obviously, the Scourge and the storylines from Warcraft 3 with the Lich King, Arthas and all that, is a prime example of Undeath in Azeroth. But actually, Undeath on Azeroth dates much, much, much further back. If you go back to the books about the Dawn of the Dragon Aspects, you will see Galakrond, and, and the force he used also had death magic, necromancy as part of his power. Like all the cosmic forces, death has touched Azeroth in numerous ways over the ages, and one of the most viable or visible and pronounced in the modern age of Azeroth is the Forsaken and the Undead who are animated. That may lead you to questions. For people like the Forsaken, are there souls in the Shadowlands? Are there souls in Azeroth? The active raising of someone like the Forsaken, someone who has intellect and mind intact, means that their soul is being anchored to their body. In life, for a living being, the soul is anchored to the body through the force of life. It is a living body, therefore life is a force that's holding the soul to it. But in the case of a Forsaken, in the case of someone who is raised from the dead, it's a different force, because life isn't present within them, and so that is the force of necromancy that is anchoring the soul to the body. 
Now, it's a different process than a living being, than someone who is kind of held together through the power of life with a capital L as one of the cosmic forces of the universe, so that forsaken person, that undead person who is held together by the power of death, and that can have an effect on the soul, and we've seen that being raised can result in certain different circumstances. One person is raised may be very much intact, they may essentially be the same person that they were in life. Others are more aggressive, more hateful, or more scornful mournful than they were in life, and part of that has to do with the manner in which they were raised. There's all kinds of factors that go into it, so I would say that being raised that way is something of an imperfect process. It's something that isn't as defined and easily categorized as the living is, but make no mistake about it. Someone who is forsaken, someone who, he, who has an intelligent undead like that, they do have their soul anchored to the mortal realm, even if for a time it had crossed over in the Shadowlands and was brought back. Alright, so a couple of things to unpack in that entire uh, answer. First of all, the answer was a little bit weird in how he structured the answer to the question, but there is a couple of things to unpack here. First and foremost, there isn't a single um fantastic realm if we can speak about fantasy in a broad sense that doesn't have necromancy as a sort of evil magic a magic that is either forbidden or really never practiced and those who do practice it tend to go down a very dark and evil path right this is almost throughout the entirety of fantasy necromancy is considered to be a taboo among almost all races within the world. So it stands to reason that if necromancy is in fact the thing that is responsible for the creation of undead and the anchoring of the soul to a body that is no longer alive, that things would go wrong. And I have explained this multiple times. I showed the the cinematic, the animatic, the Sylvanas Warbringer, right? I showed that Warbringer so many times to show you what happens to a soul when it is reanimated. Because that's exactly what I believe the Blizzard employees wanted to do. That's exactly what I believe they wanted to do. If we go Sylvanas, um, Warbringer, yeah. I believe this is what, this, this is what Blizzard wanted to show here. That sort of, uh, shall we say, that transition showed what happened to Sylvanas. The good Sylvanas, the one that actually... Uh, helped her people and served her people was gone. What came back was hateful, scornful, um, couldn't make peace with their existence, couldn't accept who they were um, or who they who they have become. Right. So Blizzard kind of showed this. We touched on this multiple times, but now it is confirmed. Right. Uh, this was also confirmed during the Battle for Azeroth quest line. I believe it's when you go to. Oh my God. What's the zone? I believe it's in Terragos Sound that the Horde get to do a quest where we bring back a soul from the dead and then you see kind of how this uh, how this soul changes, right? How this soul actually comes back almost intact, but still there there is... they the, the soul itself says that they don't feel normal. They don't feel like they felt when they were alive. Jaina's brother would be an example of someone coming back kind of good. Um... Man, I can't remember the fucking soul's name. Zeling, thank you very much. Flavin, yes, Zeling. You even see how his family runs away from him. It's the whole Zeling, raising of Zeling. And there we get a little bit of insight into what happens when a soul, when it is reanimated, when it comes back uh, from, uh, from the Shadowlands and how the Shadowlands impacts this. So quite an interesting take here. It didn't answer the question exactly because what I wanted to know when I read this question, is how does it physically come back? Who brings that soul back from the Shadowlands? Because if the soul, once you die, we're told that this is a instant process, right? You die, you go before the Arbiter, and the Arbiter places you, and this takes seconds, and, and it's done. But if a soul is dead, and it was sort of moved into one of these realms, who brings it back? It could be the Valkyr, but how do the Valkyr do this without the people in the Shadowlands going, hold up, what the fuck? Why are they taking our souls? What's going on here? This is not fair. You shouldn't be able to do this, right? So, yeah, just interesting. We've done some stuff that's involved with time travel and alternate realities. What happens to those souls when they pass on? Do they go to the Shadowlands? This is a question that I've received a million times 
from so many different people wanting to know what exactly happens with these souls from other timelines. This is a complicated question. How do you deal with things like alternate Draenor? There was a Draka there. What is that Draka? Is she alive? Is she dead? Is she related to the Draka in the Shadowlands that we see? Or is there another Draka? We know that in Waters of Draenor, Velen of that universe died. Does that mean there is a Velen in the Shadowlands? But what, uh, what about Velen and Azeroth? All these things are very complicated questions. The way I would have to think about it is, um, think about it is, think of a rope. If you look at a rope, it is one thing, right? It's something that you can grab onto, you can hold on to, you can hold it, you can see it. Think of that as a character. Think of that rope as Draka or Velen. If you look at that rope more closely, you can see there are different threads that make up the rope. There are different twines that pull together, and you can pull uh, one of uh, you can pull off one of these threads if you want. But it's still a rope, and each of these threads you can think of as one of the realities of the character, one of the streams of time. There is a thread that is the Draka from Draenor we visited in the Wall of Draenor. There is another thread that is Draka on Azeroth as we know her, and there are many other threads that could be other realities that we never peered into but all of those threads at some time come together to make that rope and remember also that as you'll see that there are many characters in the shadowlands when they refer to time they usually say that time is not a construct of death time and death are not related death is about eternity not linear time the manner in which these threads come together that can take a very long time from mortal perceptions those threads can be separated for a time but sooner or later they do combine to make one rope that is that character you can think of um you can think of it as the threads of that rope all the individual threads are just waiting and over time they will come together but they can exist as separate entities for a time that still doesn't change the fact that they are part of one rope all right so that clears it up perfectly right everyone should understand exactly what that means right <laughs> so uh there, there's some things that that actually stands out here as something that, that we might just ask we might just ask this question what if there wasn't always multiple timelines what if the reason for the multiple timelines was something that was done by whoever controlled the time or perhaps by the void itself? I've, I've received multiple comments on uh, the previous interview we did where a lot of people pointed out that what if the void are the ones in control of the timelines or at least responsible for the timelines? And that would make sense. Remember, the void sees... A thousand different possibilities and a thousand could probably be a thousand times a thousand the void sees everything it sees all of the different outcomes that could possibly exist so what if at some point there was a battle between the void and order this is even before the titans were born so we are going way back into the past here we're going before the birth of amanthul even what if the Void somehow got their hands on the timelines and shattered them? Shattered the timelines into all of the realities that they see. And this is why these timelines now exist. So basically, what happened here and what Steve Denuser is, is referring to here is all of those shattered timelines are actually still part of the whole. It still forms part of the whole, even though it's not natural. So this actually gives us even more insight into what happens to a soul when it dies and moves into the Shadowlands. So that soul either has a waiting room that it has to, uh, has to take part in while it waits for all of its other souls to sort of move into position, right? Um, or as the other souls from the other timelines die, they are simply rejoined into the character that is already there, right? This was sort of a, a very interesting discussion, in my opinion. A very interesting answer, which actually creates even more questions, which I fucking loathe. I hate when they give answers that just lead to more questions. Because that's exactly what this did. Because now I have even more questions. Anyways, let's get into the next question. I want to ask about something in relation to Drucker and Duratan. 
Can souls feel if their significant other dies, or can they even see them or visit each other in some common ground like Ouroboros? Do they know that they are both in the Shadowlands? Interesting question that might have some interesting implications, let's see. The players have witnessed in terms of what Draka experienced after coming to the Shadowlands. She has some different things to care about right now. She's been put into situations that have forced her to focus on what happened to her original house. How she can work to defend the Shadowlands, how she can root out the treachery that's taking hold of Maldraxxus. All of these things are taking the focus away from what her mortal life was. Now that doesn't, now that doesn't mean that her mortal life or mortal concerns are gone. But again, that being that are now that beings that are now in the Shadowlands, um, both these mortal souls and these beings that are native to the Shadowlands, don't think of time or perceive it quite the same way that we as players coming in do. The players coming into the Shadowlands are still alive. They still have their bodies. They've crossed over into this different realm, and they're all about solving the problem. They're fix they're trying to fix the Shadowlands, stop the jailer, save Azeroth from any uh, from any of his schemes, schemes that he's trying to inflict upon the world, so they have a very immediate sense of time in that we've got uh, we've got to get the solved so we can protect our world. Whereas souls in the Shadowlands don't perceive things that way. So, Draka and Duratan, obviously, some point along the way, did get separated. Where did Duratan go? We don't know as of yet. Does Draka know? No, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't really know. But those strands of rope I mentioned before, think of those as strands of fate. Different souls that have crossed over or in intersected one another through life, I think there is... Um, no, she doesn't. Different souls that have crossed over or intersected one another through life. I think there is probably something that draws them, that keeps some tether between them, even in the afterlife. So, I don't know if this is necessarily a lore answer or a canonical answer, but from what I read here, at least, it does feel like our souls do have the ability to make impressions. Even if these impressions aren't necessarily um, uh, tangible or very large, the way he explains it here is when we do cross each other, which again just lends even more credence to the theory that we are tethered to um, that, that we are tethered to Azeroth, right? That, that we are tethered to Azeroth. So in this instance, what what we would get from this is. Even though Draka now has things that she worries about, because she's not really worried about time. Right, so Draka doesn't think, oh my god, I have to do this quick before Duraton dies. She doesn't have to focus on Duraton right now, but she might still feel him. So somewhere in her heart, she still feels Duraton. The way the Shadowlands is set up, when things were working the way they were supposed to, and Anima was plentiful, all this machinery of death was functioning the way it was supposed to. There was an opportunity for souls sometimes to travel to, have completed one obligation, and be able to move around, whether that was to travel to Ouroboros and encounter someone there, or maybe to travel to some of these infinite afterlives that are out there in the realms of death. So don't give up hope that Draka and Duratan might be reunited someday, but right now, Draka has a job to do. And that is front and center in her mind in terms of what she needs to do in order to perhaps earn the respite that she's due and be able to visit the mortals she cared about so much in life. Interesting answer. Very interesting answer. I think from uh, from just a pure lore perspective, th this actually brings even more to the fore the evil that is the Carrions, right? Because... All of the other souls that venture into the Shadowlands, those who go to Arnwheel, those who go to uh, uh, to Maldraxxus, and those who go to Ravendraith, will retain their mortal memories. They will retain what made them mortal ones. So they would know that there are mortals or other souls out there that they were linked with once upon a time. Whereas the souls that go to Bastion, they're stripped of all of those memories, everything that once made them uh, mortal, that once made them normal, have sort of been stripped away from them, right? So they are the only ones who will never know where their actual family members is, where their husbands or wives is. So that just adds a little bit to the evil that, in my opinion, is the Kyrians. Next question. The principal powers in cosmology. 
do they also go to the Shadowlands? Or do they go back to their own place? Like the Burning Crusade goes to the Twisting Nether, where would a Naru go? When I saw this question, I got really excited for this interview. Like seriously excited for this interview. So, that same rule that we established in Legion for a being of an influence goes back if it's killed in the mortal realm or some other realm. It goes back to its home realm, its home plane. That's true for demons and that's true for other forces as well. So an answer finally to what everyone kind of fucking wanted to know, right? The answer to, well, this is one of the most asked questions I get on this channel is... You know, is it only the demons that go to, the, the, to their own realms? And I made a video on this, I argued this before, that what if every single one of these cosmological forces have their own realms set up? But it gets even more interesting, so let's keep going. So if Narus are fighting in the mortal realm, for example, a Naru is struck down, its essence would go back to the realm of light and would reconstitute there. Now, there are exceptions to that rule. If a significantly powerful force intervenes in such a way, it can throw that process off. It can either delay or subvert it in some way, but it takes a significant influence for that to happen. It's not something that casually happens. We saw this with the Una quest chain all the way back in Legion. In, in the Una quest chain, the light intervened with the death of that Draenei, right? So the light actually stepped in and said no. This soul will come to us. And I believe that this is what the light was trying to do for Uther, right? If we go to the Uther, um, no, it's the Afterlife's Bastion. If we go to the Afterlife's Bastion cinematic. So Uther asks the light to save his soul, and then this is where we see what happened, and there was actually something very interesting about this. Who did this to you? He was my student. He betrayed us all. Show me. Steve Denuser just states here that it will take a significant force, right? If a significant powerful force intervenes in such a way it can throw the process off. So the light is a significant force. I mean, the light is one of the fucking cosmological forces. The light surely does have that power. But how in the world, how powerful is this sword that not even the light could save all of Uther's soul. So the light was not significant enough to save Uther's soul. It could split it, it could take a part of it, but it couldn't take all of it. Now, if Frostmourne is what I believe Zival's soul, right, used to create Frostmourne, then that would, that would explain it. And that would prove that Zuval is in fact Titan++, plus plus, even stronger than most others, right? He is stronger than most other cosmological forces. How? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm sure we could come up with theories as to why this is happening. But this was just very interesting to me. Um, it can either delay it or subvert it in some way, but it takes a significant influence for that to happen. It's not something that casually happens. For example, people have talked about Brydenbrad, the hero who died in Northrend. We saw the light intervene to save him and pull him away. That's the case of one of the forces having a direct tie to a character and going out of its way to kind of yank it out of the normal cycle and a little bit to do something different with it, right? Those cases are, are the exception rather than the rule. So if you destroyed a being of the light, it would go back to the realm of light and to really destroy it, you would have to go to the realm of light to destroy it there. And there's another, um... Ah! <laughs> 
I'm not even gonna say anything. Remember, remember, if a significant force intervenes, it can pull you to another realm. It can stop you from actually going to the Shadowlands. You will be remembered as the king who sacrificed his life for nothing. For the Alliance. What if Varian isn't inside the Shadowlands? What if Varian isn't inside the Shadowlands because he can't be? Right, that, that would be... That would be my thinking on this. That might be why this was important for him to point out that this can happen. But there needs to be a significant force involved in this. All right, so we see the cosmological map here. Taking into consideration the fact that the Shadowlands isn't in its best condition right now, are there any Shadowlands realms where it doesn't feel like you are basically requested to have an eternity of servitude? It feels pretty rough that, like you know you work hard, you retire, you die, you get drafted again. Pretty interesting question there. It is true that the realms we're visiting are the core to the functioning of how the Shadowlands works as a cosmic force in the universe. There is a responsibility there. Much is asked of the souls that go to Bastion. Again, we wanted to play with that, that notion of visually looking at it and seeing this kind of idyllic paradise, but they have a huge responsibility placed on their shoulders. Maldraxxus is a huge responsibility. Ravendreth is all about taking these souls that have potential to either do something great or to to be lost to darkness and trying to save them and Ardenweald takes care of these very important nature spirits that need to go back into the cycle and preserve that so all of these realms have very important duties that they have to accomplish in order for the Shadowlands and the realms beyond to function but we have said that the Shadowlands is a place of infinite afterlives and I certainly picture that there are places that are free of obligation places that could just be an idyllic paradise for someone or a place of just unending punishment and torment because they were just that bad or just needed to endure something to pay them back for what happened in life any of those possibilities that you can imagine exists somewhere in the shadowlands this immediately brings me to shadows rising in shadows rising one somebody shows he shows zappy boy um this image of Saofam with his family in the afterlife now, we all argued that that was a complete lie to get uh, Zappy Boy to do what, what, what one somebody wanted him to do. But what if it wasn't a lie? What if Sylvanas truly did give Saurfang the death he always wanted, the warrior's death that he always wanted? When she killed him, she actually did send him to his family. So she actively intervened in that process. She ensured that he would move on to his family and he would not be stuck in the mall. In my opinion, that might show a different side to Sylvanas. We know that there was some level of respect between Sylvanas and Saofang. This is made even more real when you look at... Um, we've discussed this before, but... I just want to show you. I trusted you. And so did they. Death comes, old soldier, and all their hope dies with you. There was a level of respect in Sylvanas first and foremost accepting this Makura. She didn't have to. She could have just said, no, I don't give a fuck. I'm not going to accept this. Uh, let's go to war, right? It would have certainly um, led 
to far more death, which meant more souls feeding into the ball. But she showed him the respect that he deserved by accepting the Makura. And before people go, dude, she has to accept the Makura. It's part of the Horde culture. It's not part of Horde culture. It's an orcish thing. Makura is 100% an orc thing. There is no reason why a Forsaken has to honor a Makura, right? Orcs have to do that. Otherwise, you lose all... Uh, all standing within the community now yeah we could probably argue and say no 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 but because the orcs were such a fundamental part in the forming of the horde the rest of the horde has also accepted that the makura is kind of important and that the makura is sacred but for the most part it's only orcs that really give a shit about makura um that, that really honor the makura uh so the fact that Tavana showed him that level of respect immediately tells us that maybe Savannah did put him there, and when somebody wasn't lying uh, to Zappy Boy, when somebody truly was showing uh, Zappy Boy where Sao Fang is now. But anyways, uh, that's why when we talk about certain characters and you try to pick which afterlife they would go to, keep in mind that there are limitless other places they might end up with within Shadowlands. Maybe we'll get peeks into some of those. Maybe we won't. But any of those characters that you know and care about can exist somewhere in this realm. And when it's someone you like and care about, you hope they're in a happy place. You know like Duratan, if everything went great for him, he's probably in this endless hunting ground where he has his wolves around him and he can just go out there. He doesn't have to worry about any dark forces wrecking his world. He can just enjoy that forever. And you know what? Maybe Drucker can someday fulfill her obligations and join him there. Who knows? We'll see. So even more insight into um, free will, except for the Carrions. So if Drucker full, fulfills her duties, she could join. Um, she could join Duratan. She could leave Maldraxxus effectively. Everyone except for the Carrions. They don't get to leave because they don't get to remember who they were. But it does tell us that these souls, even though the question uh, pretty much asked what all of us were thinking, why the hell after you die, do you just get, you know, you, you just get drafted effectively to start working again, right? This doesn't seem like a good afterlife. This doesn't seem like, uh, a, 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 it, it, it seems a little bit unfair, right? We have all these struggles in our mortal lives. Then we get synced to the afterlife and the struggles just fucking continue. It doesn't let up, right? This is not the kind of afterlife that most people cared about, right? And so this is kind of saying, no, no, you could choose. You still have that free will. You could decide to go join your partner somewhere else or move to a different uh, Shadowlands realm if that is what you chose. There have been rumors in the community about the origins of a new class, Necromancer. Maldraxxus looks like a good start for that. Is, is it a hint for players? Now, I have some bad news. I did actually read this section. While Maldraxxus is all about necromancy, and we are exploring some flavors of it that we haven't seen on Azeroth before, it was not meant to imply that there is a new class coming or anything like that. It really is just the story of the realm of Maldraxxus and the inhabitants that are within it. It's not meant to be something that we're going to give to players as a new class or something like that now you could always argue that blizzard would say that right even if they were planning it they would kind of be tight-lipped about it let's be real it is blizzard it's what they do they don't tend to give away secrets unless they absolutely have to but uh we'll talk about afterwards why i think people should really lose the idea of new classes entirely i don't think you're gonna get a new class uh, for a very very long time are there any Shadowlands realms that you wish we could go visit, but maybe there wasn't enough time or the story would have gone too long if we went there, etc.? If you ask any storyteller or, de or designer or artist on the WoW team, did you ever wish we you could do more with those things? Every one of us will say, oh yes man, we had so many great ideas that we explored and we went a different way for whatever reason. So the answer is yes, there were always other things that we could explore and some of those things will be realized in some of the updates to the Shadowlands. I have told you guys this before and I just wish to reiterate it. We know of at least three new zones that will be added in the Shadowlands, right? Three patches, three new zones. There are three arcways 
uh, that lead to different realms within Oribos that is as of yet unfold. Three empty arcways. So there is at least three more zones that we will go to. Um, the shannons that you'll see come out over time and things like that. And others may be down the road. We will find a way to introduce those. Whenever we bring a new toy, think of each expansion is giving us new toys to play, new places that, uh, that we can go, places that we can revisit down the line. I think certainly in the future, even after we've got expansions coming after the Shadowlands, is kind of been told and the story is complete, there will still be opportunities to return to Shadowlands and maybe some of those other rounds come to life i like to think of this expansion as opening a lot of doors for us i've said this before right uh, if there's one thing that i love about shadowlands it's the fact that shadowlands finally throws open the lore of world of warcraft for the first time ever uh there, the, the the narrow storytelling arc the blizzard kind of had to walk since a lot of things in the past dealt with past canonical lore right so making a change in legion could have had significant impact on past canonical lore whereas in the shadowlands it's dealing with lore that we've never dealt with before the shadowlands was a fucking footnote in the chronicles a footnote so in essence this gives blizzard all the freedom that they could ever require to take the story in whichever way they really want um or at least creating lots of doorways that we could go through in the future. And that's one of the most fun things about it. And that is really set, uh, sets up the universe of Warcraft to have even more alleys to explore and avenues in the future that'll be really exciting. How does it feel going back to a story that's going to weave through zones as a single pathway after going through a very pick where you wanna go, do your adventures next approach? It feels really good. We, uh, what we wanted to embrace this time around was to go back to some of that linear narrative that leads, uh, leads you through the expansion. We just didn't want to force the player to go through every bit of a zone at a time before working their way through the story. What we've gone for this time really encompasses the best of both worlds because we do get to tell the linear narrative that builds up and has points of tension and rises and falls in certain ways that you can't get if you let the choice go to the player. So we get that opportunity to tell that kind of story while still giving players a big sense of choice. Choices are a huge theme in this expansion, both the presence of it and in terms of how the afterlives see it, the things they're imp imposing upon the souls that come to those afterlives. Um, so uh, personally, I love the more linear storytelling of the Shadowlands. It just leads for an overall story that is being told. So rather than what you had in previous expansions like Legion, uh, like Battle for Azeroth, where the story really started and ended in its own little zone, uh, with linear quest lines, you, you actually get to play a, a complete story. So the story feeds into the next and every single story makes you look forward more and more to the ultimate conclusion of that story. And there's even throwbacks in um you know in maldraxxus to stuff that you did in bastion and stuff that you saw in bastion there's throwbacks in ardenweald to stuff that you see um in maldraxxus there's there's actually a bit of precursor in ardenweald to things that you'll see in revendreth uh, so all of these stories just makes for a better experience in my opinion so personally I prefer linear storytelling, especially for World of Warcraft. And I like the fact that once you've done it once, you can go your alt and you just don't even have to do the story again, right? So the new alt experience is actually quite interesting. You start you start your alt, you get to Ouroboros and then you say, no, I've seen the story, no, no more. And they say, right, do dungeons, world quests, do whatever the fuck you want, right? It's your game, you can play the way you want. We also wanted to give, give players the choice to pick a covenant and use that as a lens through which they see the big parts of the story, the, uh, story through. And having those choices have different meanings, different consequences, and gives you opportunities to make different choices on other characters. As you may have just seen on our most recent beta update, when you play through the storyline on one character, you can elect to skip that storyline on, uh, on a subsequent alt if you want to, and just engage with the world in the way that you see fit. And kind of going through and just playing world quest dungeon side quests. However, you want to engage with the world, giving you that sense of choice how you 
you as a player want to go through this. I like to think of it as us getting the best of both worlds, of us having all the benefits of a linear storyline while still giving a ton of agency to our players to engage with that story in whatever manner they see fit. So this is one of the reasons I generally speaking hate open world games. Um, and I don't mean I hate them and that I don't play them, but I genuinely prefer linear storytelling almost always over open world. And the reason for it is a lot of gaming companies use open world as an excuse to not really give you a good story, right? So there are games that do it well. I would say a game like that would be Skyrim. I would say Witcher 3 is very good at that. Uh, but most of the time, when you read open world, what you should read is we couldn't be fucking asked giving you a good storyline. So we're just going to we're just going to give you a whole world to explore and kind of waste your time with uh, a series of objectives and things that you're going to do that's going to feel exactly the same as everything else that you did prior to it, just maybe with a bit more upscaled enemies. Whereas with a linear storyline, you do actually get to dive into that story and make that story part of, of what you want that story to tell, right? And this is Shadowlands over and over again. Just FYI, if, if you haven't played Shadowlands yet, oh my God, you're going to enjoy that story. Um... We know there are six elements, as one of them is spirit. Does spirit have any connection with anima at all? When you look at the cosmolo cosmology chart, which is an interpretation of these forces, it's one way to structure them and visually understand them. You'll certainly see parallels between some of the elemental magics and some of the higher forms of magics that you see. I think of the elemental magics as being of primal magics, and then those big forces of order, disorder, life, death, light, and void, those are structured end of high magics. So the elemental planes is primal magics, and then order, disorder, life, death, light, and void would be high magics. So in other words, this is actually rather massive, considering that for the longest time, most of us has actually looked at it as the cosmological forces are the primal powers, and then the elemental forces would kind of slip in between them, right? So they, they would actually just slip under them. But according to what Denuza is saying here, the, the elemental forces are actually above the, 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 the cosmological forces. They're the primal ones, they're the original ones. So this tells us, perhaps, what the first ones deal in. So if the cosmological forces deal in their own brand of magic, right? So for example, Order deals with Arcane, right? Or at least uses Arcane. The Foul uses Chaos, right? Death uses Spirit, in a way. Life could use Spirit, but also Life Magics then the first ones quite literally exists within the primal planes. They exist within the primal magic sphere. So they're not limited to any one of these cosmological forces. They're basically, they have access to all of these forces. A lot of the storyline that we've seen play out across Azeroth and some of the other worlds is how those uh, more primal forces interact with the more structured or high magic forces. I certainly think that there are echoes of spirits in how anima is, but again, anima is something that is tied to mortals. That's something unique to them. When you think of the mortals in the mortal realm, when you look at the, that cosmolo cosmology chart, it's the mortal realm that's in the middle of all of it. So one could interpret all of those other forces have echoes that kind of resonate out and touch the mortal realm in ways. So you could say that there are some things about spirit and its function as an elemental force that exists at this cosmic level. And there are echoes of our anima, what means to a mortal soul and how that feels the Shadowlands, fuels the Shadowlands and what goes on there. So certainly thematic echoes, but they are different things. So again, uh, just a little bit of a reiteration on anima and where anima lies. Now, I do want to go to this cosmological force, uh, to the cosmological map, and just leave you guys with this. And this is the discussion that we'll have in a moment. But I do want to leave you guys with this before chat, you and I start to discuss this interview. We are led to believe that there are six cosmological forces, right? Light, life, order, shadow, death, disorder. But 
What if there are seven? What if reality in its own way is a cosmological force on its own? So in other words, what if reality has been hijacked? What if mortal souls were never actually meant to go into the Shadowlands? Because Shadowlands is the realms of death. It's the cosmological force of death. What if the mortal souls in reality were meant to go back to their own plane? In other words, we had our own plane that we would go to, much like with these other cosmological forces, right? Which Steve the Newser again touched on, which we'll discuss. But I'm just going to leave you with that question. Um, and then, of course, I want to hear all of your thoughts. I, I legitimately want to hear what you guys have to say about this.